everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Um, today's webinar is going to focus on ongoing challenges with MAT and recovery during this public health emergency that we are currently in. I'm Kayla, I'm a project manager at Qualidine. Um, and today's speakers for this webinar are Elizabeth Fowley Mock and Elaine O'Connor. But before we turn it over to them, I'm just going to go over a little bit of the logistics for the webinar. Um, you are in listen-only mode, so we ask that you use the Q&A function to ask questions or make comments. We um, have been mindful in planning this webinar to leave plenty of time for comments and questions. Um, so please enter questions into the Q&A feature, which is in your toolbar throughout this, and we will save about probably 20 to 30 minutes at the end to answer those questions. The video screen size and location is adjustable, so you just need to click on it and drag it around if it's in the way of the slides. Um, you can easily do that with your mouse. And if you are joining by phone or there's multiple of you attending from the same computer, um, we just ask that you either enter your name and your email address into the chat window, or if you can send an email to myself, it's kcole at qualidime.org. Um, that's great. We just need those records for attendance, especially if you are working to claim um, CME for this webinar. We do want to thank um, the State of Maine Department of Health and Human Services and the Office of Maine Care for providing funding for this webinar today. Um, they fund us through a value-based purchasing contract, so we were able to go ahead and kind of use that to meet the ongoing need of how to address some of this work during the pandemic. Uh, most of you already know about Qualidime. We recently merged about a year and a half ago. We were formerly Maine Quality Counts. Um, we have multiple offices across New England and we work on quality improvement projects um, and initiatives such as improving care for those with OUD and SUD. Um, so there is CME available for today. Today's speakers do not have any relevant financial relationships with the manufacturers of any commercial products and or providers of commercial services discussed in the CME activity. CME will be available for participants who have signed into the live webinar, so that's why it's important that we have your email addresses and names in the chat box um, or that you email them to me so we have those for your record. After this, there will be um, a survey that either pops up automatically in your web browser, but we will also put the survey link in the chat box at the end for you to click on. Sometimes some browsers pop, um, block that pop up, so we'll put it in the chat box as well. If you go ahead and complete that evaluation of this, at the end, you'll have the ability to download your CME certificate. Again, if you have any problems with that, you can certainly reach out to myself, kcole at qualidime.org, and I can help you through that. So getting into the, the speakers for today, um, as I mentioned before, we have Elizabeth and Elaine. Um, Elizabeth is a self-employed family physician consultant living in Holden, Maine. She attended Vanderbilt Medical School and more notably these days obtained a master's in public health at UNC Chapel Hill in all her free time. Um, she is a clinical educator and instructor for the Maine State Academic Detailing Program, MICUS, and Alosa Health in Boston. She is board certified in both family medicine and addiction medicine. Her part-time clinical work includes evening shifts as a hospitalist and prescribing at a high-risk, low-barrier buprenorphine clinic. She is passionate about, um, about women's and girls' basketball, travel, learning, chess, and singing. And I think the other important thing to note today is that both of our speakers um, are people that are active in this work and prescribing, and so they're kind of going to talk about what they've been going through the, uh, as well during this time and provide some of you know, their tips and tricks throughout this. So our, um, our second speaker today, who's actually going to go first, is Elaine O'Connor. Um, she's been on the faculty of Maine Dartmouth Family Medicine Residency since 2006. Her clinical work focuses on addiction medicine and the management of opioid use disorders using buprenorphine. She helped develop an integrated medical and behavioral health treatment program that has served um, opioid-dependent pregnant women. Dr. O'Connor has published original research on infant outcomes following exposure to buprenorphine during pregnancy in many journals, including the Journal of Maternal and Fetal and Natal, Neonatal Medicine, the Journal of Substance Use um, Treatment, and the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Through her role as a co-chair of Maine General's Opioid Steering Committee, she works to expand access to MAT in the primary care setting by mentoring other clinicians and practices. She also coordinates the residency's addiction medicine education and has academic appointments at Dartmouth Medical School in Vanderbilt University. Um, so again, today's webinar is really focusing on 
how we can help you all think about implementing changes to prescribing, screening, and MET workflows to accommodate social distancing, which has been uh, you know, a big factor over the past five to six weeks for many of us. Also consider how you can best support persons in recovery, especially those in early recovery during this difficult time, and review resources um, and services available for MAT and telehealth support. So as mentioned, we will save plenty of time for questions um, at the end, but I am going to turn it over to Elaine at this point, who is going to start first. Great, can you hear me okay? We can. That's perfect, great. Well, thanks so much. Um, I'm delighted to be here today um, with uh, Dr. Mock to talk about uh, MAT in a time of public health emergency and social distancing. Um, we want to thank, first of all, uh, Qualodyme and Maincare for bringing us together and helping support this webinar. I think it's really important to have this dialogue. As uh, Kayla mentioned, neither Elizabeth or I accept any money um, from any pharmaceutical companies or have any commercial interest in anything we're going to talk about. Um, we're really going to just try to brainstorm with you today and talk about general recommendations that we have. I mean, I think what you're all aware of is that um, things are changing on an almost daily basis in terms of recommendations and um, and rules that have been relaxed as, as a means of supporting patients that are in recovery. Um, so we don't have slides because it really changes every day, um, but we have sort of our own clinical practice experience on the ground um, and our own experience over the last couple months. When we use the term um, buprenorphine throughout this webinar, we are meaning the um, combination buprenorphine naloxone product. So it's just easier to say only one word and that's you. So a brief outline of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to start with just some of the MAT workflows and what we're doing in our clinical practice. And then Elizabeth's going to take over and talk about some of the psychosocial support challenges. Um, she's also done a put together a tremendous list of resources that we're going to share with everyone so that you have access to it. And then as Kayla mentioned, we have lots of time for questions. So I think, if, you know, first thing off, you know, why do we have support structures in place um, in terms of um, uh, protocols and procedures for our clinics? And really we want to prevent diversion. So we wanna make sure that the medications we prescribe are going to the people that we prescribe them to. And we're really trying to enhance accountability and um, provide a support and structure to patients as they engage in recovery. And I think we really can't understate how important that is to our patients to really provide that framework and structure um, as they're you know, maybe coming in um, with a high acuity setting and really needing that, that, that sort of um, structure around them. The other thing to consider right now is a lot of the other structures that are in place in terms of societal issues, uh, it might be probation and parole, um, and you know, probation officers are having a lot less contact with their, with their clients than they did previously. Uh, similarly, Child Protective Services, at least in my work, is involved in a lot of my patients' lives, um, and effectively, they're not having a lot of contact with with um, my patients either at this point. So, um, and I, most of our patients, or many of our patients, you know, certainly not all of them, but really thrive in a structured supportive environment. So I think when you're taking care of patients during this time, which is really challenging, it's really important to strike a balance between um, making sure that you're providing the support and care and structure that they need, while also keeping them safe. Um, so we certainly don't wanna you know, expose them to COVID or other things or bring them out in the community when we don't have to. But we want to make sure that we strike a balance there. And a lot of times with my patients, it's really shared decision making. Um, so we talk about, you know, what do you need right now and how can I help support you? Um, do you want longer prescriptions? Do you not? Those types of issues to make sure that they feel safe. So we want to communicate with patients that the usual rules are temporarily altered. So this is a very unique time. I mean, we've never lived through anything like this before. Um, so there's lots of changes in how we're delivering care. It's a fluid thing that's changing every day. Um, when I talk to patients on the phone, I say, you know, what we're doing a month from today might be totally different. So please just bear with us uh, as we try to accommodate and be flexible with all of your needs. We do really want to reassure patients, and I can't, this is really important, that the availability of their prescription is we're still going to provide their medication, we're still going to provide their treatment. I think, you know, we have patients call the office and say, oh my goodness, are you all closed? And, and so there's this fear that somehow um, they're not going to be able to access treatment or that they might not be able to get their prescription on time. So we really want to make sure that they, that they know that we're here to support them and we're going to continue caring for them. We're also hearing sort of anecdotally on the street about a reduced uh, supply of Suboxone being available on the street for folks who might not have engaged in treatment. Um, so I think there's a lot of desperation as people are you know, thinking about getting into treatment and also fearing that there is not treatment available. Um, we're also seeing a little bit of a reduced supply in illicit drugs, and then we're, at least in our kind of central main community, seeing a marked increase in the, in the very severe drugs uh, in terms of um, 
uh, heroin, fentanyl, and actually some carfentanyl. Um, patients are reporting that there are you know, a multitude of overdoses. Um, people saying that, you know, I've came closest to overdosing that I've ever come. We're seeing actual fatal overdoses. Um, and then, you know, reports within our own needle exchange around the number of um, times our kits, our Narcan kits that are being handed out are being used um, to reverse a patient in an opioid overdose. We've seen a marked increase. So even though the data doesn't suggest that we're actually seeing an overall increase of fatal overdoses, I think um, we may at some point, and it's a very high risk situation in terms of the drugs that are available on the street. Um, so we just really want to make sure that patients have access to treatment. Um, capacity for new starts is really important. Um, so we've definitely kept our ED induction program going throughout this. And, you know, we're not necessarily encouraging people to go to the ED if, if, if there's other ways to get them into treatment. But we want them to make sure that they know that we're open for business, that we're here to help them, that they can go through the emergency department. Um, we've actually seen an increase in the number of patients who are going in through the ED because that is the one access point that's a reliable place. Um, if we have contact with a patient, say, who makes contact with a recovery coach or something, we are trying to bring them in through our higher, high acuity clinic as opposed to through the ED if we can help it. Um, but certainly the ED is an option. Um, we're asking folks from other treatment programs to make sure that you really return phone calls quickly, um, that patients are able to access services and get into care. Um, in my practice, we're asking all of our patients actually to give two phone numbers. Um, just recognizing that the phone is really a, a hugely important thing right now as a means to contact our patients. And we recognize that sometimes phone numbers get shut off or switch or, you know, you run out of minutes, that kind of thing. So we want to make sure that we have access to our patients. Um, certainly, many patients are getting longer uh, prescriptions than they were previously. Uh, in our clinical practice, we have decided, we sort of landed on that we have the same frequency of contact with our patients. Um, that we had previously, but we are seeing them in person sort of half as often. So if we had a patient who's on, um, you know, weekly visits prior to COVID, um, we're still talking to them every week, but we're seeing them in person um, every other week. Um, so some folks are, as a result, getting longer prescriptions than they might be used to, which can be hard for people. Um, so we really want to make sure that that feels safe and that feels okay. Um, the other piece to be aware of is that um, many of the methadone clinics are also giving out longer take-homes for folks who are in treatment there. Um, and in my own clinical practice, I've seen a pretty marked uptick in the number of patients who are testing positive for methadone. Um, so I think to some extent that medication that's in take-homes is getting um, diverted or, or shared with others. Um, so just, just the point really being that it's a high-risk situation for our patients. Um, there's a lot of things happening out there that are concerning. Um, and I haven't seen as many people test positive for methadone as I have in the last month um, for years. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, in terms of screening, so one of the topics that folks are really interested in is, is drug screening. So I, I'm going to use the term, we do saliva drug screening almost exclusively. Um, so saliva and urine, I'm going to sort of use, um, they can mean the same thing in many ways. So I think we're contacting our patients. We're certainly doing fewer screenings than we were before. I think that's probably true for everybody. Um, but you really just have to decide, you know, um, who you need to see, when you need to see them, and try to come up with the best plan that you can. Um, random call-ins are a good option. Um, we have um, continued our random drug screen program. Um, we have a voicemail message that patients call twice a week to, to learn whether they have to come in for a random. But we have added a, a part to the message which says, you know, if you're feeling sick or you're concerned about it coming into the office, so please call us and check in um, with your medication prescriber. So that really just continues to enhance the accountability, make sure that they're still you know, participating in the random program and that they'll be part of it um, when this COVID crisis is over. But in terms of um, workflows for necessary, or for necessary call-ins, you know, we are trying to bring people in. Um, so our high, we're seeing our high acuity folks more. Um, we're screening them a little bit more than the rest of the folks. Um, we're trying to really be creative um, in terms of um, making sure that they're safe. So, for example, in my practice, I work in a primary care setting. You know, we're seeing well patients in the morning and sick patients in the afternoon. So where I'm really trying to bring in all my MAT patients in the morning. Um, we're trying not to have certainly too many together at any one time. Uh, so making sure that they are, you know, adequately spaced in the waiting room, that they're screened for symptoms. We're also calling them in advance to find out if they have any symptoms um, suggestive of COVID to make sure that they, you know, we adjust the plan as needed. Um, in terms of getting specimens, they don't have to be linked to appointments per se. Um, sometimes we're linking them, sometimes we're not. 
um, we are bringing folks in sometimes for a screen and then we'll do a telehealth visit um, thereafter. Um, we do not have access, unfortunately, to um, this type of, of telehealth at my institution. We just have the phone. Um, so, but there are a number of really great options if you can access um, patients and see them uh, in terms of uh, tamper-proof uh, specimen collections that you can mail to your patients, have them do a saliva screen while they're in front of you, and then you can mail them back. Um, they could do pill or film counts in front of you as well. So those are all really great options. Um, we have, uh, the other thing that some places are doing are sort of collection events or almost saliva drive-through testing. So actually quite similar to how they're screening for COVID that people can drive up in their car um, and have a quick sample taken. It, certainly that works obviously for saliva, less so for urine, um, but then get on their way. Um, they don't even have to get out of the car or come in. Um, we are doing a similar thing with um, a sort of vestibule in our office where people can um, have a specimen collected um, outside and it's observed through a window. Um, it's in a private sort of space and nobody's watching it, but um, in terms of nobody from the outside watching it. So those are all options in terms of gathering um, specimens and being able to screen. Um, so telehealth, obviously a great option. Um, you can link those to the screens or not, um, and um, they may be connected to the prescriptions or not. Um, the one thing that MinCare did want to make clear is that um, the, the requirement for eight specimens a year is still active. Um, so you do need to make sure that you consider that, at least in how you're doing things. Um, you know, we certainly we screen at least once a month as a general rule, um, but it's, it's something you need to think about, particularly if you have people. I have some folks on monthlies that have been stable for, you know, a long period of time and I haven't seen them for a couple months. So I do need to start thinking about, um, you know, how, when I'm going to bring them in to make sure I'm compliant with that part of the program. Um, the other piece to think about, so we've started, you know, as we're starting to reopen and think about who we're bringing back in, um, in terms of how to screen people, we're trying to, you know, feel out people who are really concerned about coming in, so we may do their screening in the vestibule or as a drive-in, people who have high-risk COVID contacts at home in terms of um, some with chronic disease or a young person, or also people who they themselves may have had some um, contact with somebody else who has COVID. So like, for example, we have a patient um, who's uh, someone they live with, works in a nursing home, has probably been exposed to COVID, but the patient themselves doesn't have symptoms. But we are trying to sort of screen them separately in a different location just to keep everybody safe. I think the other big challenge we're finding is folks who have a chronic smoker's cough. Um, so they screen positive for COVID because they cough, um, but trying to understand is it different? Is it in any way changed? Um, so those are all questions that we're sort of asking as we're trying to think about how do we get folks back in um, and then trying to, you know, it's been nuanced and we can certainly talk more in the question answer period, but around folks who are, have long-term COVID symptoms or we have not been able to get in, how to manage folks that we're not seeing. Certainly it's clear we don't want to discharge people, but we also need to have, make sure we have some access to folks. Um, so again, lots of contact. The more that you can have contact with your patients, the more that you can support them and structure and provide that structure. Um, In-person mixed with telehealth, the counseling telehealth, um, Patients are really enjoying. Um, I have many that are doing um, online 12-step meetings and support services, smart recovery, that kind of thing. They love it. Um, they love being able to do it from the an anonymity of their home. Um, they also like, um, they can join, for example, I have a patient who did a residential um, treatment program in a different part of the state, and there was a meeting she loved. Um, and she's now able to join that uh, meeting because they do it online. Um, and it also helps with patients who, I have a number of women in particular who don't like going to, um, they prefer women's only groups because, and they're not a lot in our area, but they don't like that sort of social scene with, um, you know, other people before and after the meeting in terms of things that might be happening in the, in the parking lot or, or unwanted advances uh, on the part of others. So it's really been a nice thing for patients. We do want to talk to patients about rationing meds. So I know some patients are feeling like, oh my God, if I'm not going to get my next prescription or things are closed or I can't get to the pharmacy, patients are also worried that the pharmacies are going to be closed. So we need to continue to reassure them that they're going to get their meds, the pharmacies are open. They should not be rationing their meds in any way. They should be taking their prescription, their prescribed dose as normal. Um, similarly, on the flip side, you know, you do see patients who sometimes are, use an excess of their prescription as a means to manage anxiety. So, you know, people are really worried right now. They're anxious. Sometimes they feel a little bit better if they take a little bit more of their medication, which we really want to discourage. 
Um, and I'm seeing more of that, particularly in folks who are getting a longer than usual prescription. So they feel like, well, geez, I can just take up, you know, an extra quarter of a film today and I won't really notice that. And then they're really running short at the end. So really trying to support patients uh, in taking their prescriptions um, as they should be. Um, naloxone, naloxone, naloxone. So, you know, we're both going to hit on that point. Um, really get that out there. Co-prescribe whenever you can. Hand it out whenever you see folks. Um, you know, again, it, high risk drugs that are on the street right now. Um, and, you know, we're getting a lot of reports um, of folks being reversed. Um, so try to get that out there as much as you can from a harm reduction perspective. Um, the other thing to think about is, as an MAT prescriber is to make sure that you have an adequate contingency plan in place if you yourself contract COVID, um, particularly if you're one of, say, two people who does this, making sure that there's a good cross coverage plan uh, in place so that patients are adequately covered and certainly remote access um, to be able to fill scripts from home, say, for example, if you're not able to go into the office for whatever reason, um, you could be having your staff communicate with the patients that filling prescriptions with your EHR or um, electronic prescribing system. So now I will pass it off. So hi, everyone, from, from the other side of things. <clears throat> um, I really appreciate uh, hearing Elaine's perspective on things, because when she talks about things in her clinic, it gives me ideas about how we might improve or do things a little bit differently in our clinic, even though we feel like we have certain workflows put together, uh, there are certainly a lot of options for them to be improved. Um, so. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the challenges of psychosocial support. Kayla, I'm only seeing a blank screen of Elaine on my screen and not me, not that I wanna see myself in big color, but. That's just the speaker view. I, um, I think everybody can see you. Um, you can adjust okay. people's view by gallery or speaker. It's in the top of your screen towards the right. All right, um, that's good because see, even, even I have trouble with the platform. Uh, so in, in terms of thinking about psychosocial support, um, you know, you go back to the baseline availability and already in the state of Maine, we had huge challenges in terms of workforce for behavioral health providers and counselors, LADCs, LCSWs. Uh, that was already a huge challenge that we didn't have enough in enough places. Um, so thinking about that, but then thinking about where's the opportunity in that challenge now where there's less restriction, there's more emphasis on remote services and, and how can we help people in that, um, in that aspect. There's always been a challenge for payment issues, and particularly for people who are uh, not insured um, to, to access services, especially behavioral health services and counseling. Um, and then thinking about different clinic models. So if you have a medication first model where you're trying to stabilize people and then get them into counseling, uh, how does that interface with this current structure uh, thinking about different levels of recovery, uh, Elaine mentioned yesterday, you know, they have some people in very long-term recovery, and some of them have really graduated, so to speak, through their counseling and structured groups, and they're several years out. And so what does psychosocial support look for people? So there are uh, not every patient is in the same place in their recovery, and the patients that I work with in my clinic are specifically very early in recovery, very high risk, low barrier. I work in a bridge clinic, which is a medication first model. So some of the things that I do in my clinic are very different than what's gonna happen when my people successfully stay with me for a month or two and, and enter our formal recovery program. So I wanna remind people there is a high degree of coexisting mental illness in this population and that uh, sometimes as a family physician, uh, I trained in North Carolina, and then I moved home to Maine four years after I graduated from residency. And there were two things that struck me when I moved home to Maine at the end of 2003, beginning 2004. Number one was the volume of opioid prescribing, because we weren't at that point yet in North Carolina, but certainly we caught up, and uh, they caught up. Um, and number two was the amount of psychic medication management I was doing as a primary care provider, which was not what I was really prepared for. I was prepared fairly well as a family physician, but the amount and the degree of psychiatric medication management that was needed by my patients and the lack of access to specialty services in uh, mental health, behavioral health, really struck me. So as a family physician, especially over the past 16 years in Maine, I've become more accustomed to my, my uneasiness with prescribing uh, psychiatric medications and doing what I can. So especially in this time, there are some patients where I feel a tad bit of unease, if 
but I go ahead and refill their medications, especially the ones that they're on. I've had a few people have started on mood stabilizers, um, and I talked to some of my uh, psychiatric colleagues and uh, psychiatric uh, nurse, mental health nurse practitioners, um, and and try to understand that I don't think that I can fully equip my patients to do well in their early recovery if I'm not meeting both sides of their co-occurring illness. So I like to talk about that. In terms of online resources, uh, there's a lot out there and it really depends on the person. Elaine mentioned running out of minutes, which is a huge problem for people who don't have access to unlimited data, unlimited, unlimited telephone services. So some people might have a phone, but given the day, it may or may not be off. So that's a challenge for a lot of our patients. Accessing the internet is a challenge. Um, also, it's not available in all areas, and it's uh, certainly not available for free in many areas. Uh, although, you know, if you have access to a car, you can go sit outside a commercial establishment that has, I haven't checked if uh, the eating facilities that only have drive through open still have their Wi-Fi on, but uh, it's, a, it's a point of access that sometimes is the only point available. There are lots of individual small groups um, available either within your current practice. So we have two of our recovery program behavioral health people who are working exclusively from home, and that's working well for them. Um, there might be access within your current system, and then like I said, there might be new venues or new people that are available because the availability to do more telehealth. There are lots of support groups going on, but they are different like everything in our lives. I researched a little bit this morning the Bangor Area Recovery Network and the Portland Recovery Network. In our outline, I'm going to send a link which talks about all the different recovery networks in the state of Maine. They are offering all kinds of things on, on, on the phone, including telephone support, coaching, virtual recovery meetings, twice a day in Bangor, multiple times a day in Portland. And you know, there's nothing that says, I don't believe, that if you live wherever, you can't hop onto the Portland meeting. Um, because it, it's there and it's, it's available to people. There are national groups. I have a great story about one patient who is more stable in her recovery than most of my patients, and she's back to work. She's working as a CNA in a nursing home, and her nursing home had fortunately only one case of COVID, so they all got screened and everyone else came back negative. But she just talked a little bit about that, and I talked to her about how important she is. She works three to 11, she'll come home and she'll jump onto an NA meeting at midnight. And she said, how amazing is that? That now, because I have this uh, off-kilter work schedule, I have resources available to me that weren't available to me before. But now I can jump on and do NA at midnight as I'm winding down from my day's work and then go to bed at 1 a.m. So I thought that that was a, a great story of how she is adjusting and adapting in a really beneficial manner. Um, things that we can do if, if we have some staff because primary care has been extraordinarily slow in most locations. Our volumes are down tremendously. We have some staff that aren't busy and we're trying to sort of think of work for them to do to, because we're trying to pay their salary but they don't actually have anything to do. Um, calling people and checking in on people more often than we would be. Just calling them on the phone. It's not if a uh, MA calls a patient on the phone, it's not necessarily billable or reimbursable, but it's a service and it's a way to keep people connected and engaged in treatment. And if you're paying your MA and you're trying to do your best to keep them engaged and on the payroll, then, then that's a nice extra thing that they can be providing to the patients. And I'll tell you, a lot of my patients tell my MA some things that they don't tell me. Um, she just, she's worked with recovery for a long time and she just has She's, she just kind of gets it, and I think my patients connect with her, especially where I'm a part-time recovery provider. We have three different doctors who cover four days a week. The MA is the one constant. If you come in and see any of the three of us, you, you typically will see her as well. And so there are some connections there, and that can, continuity of care is really important for our patients. Uh, let's see what else. Um, High stress levels for everyone, rapid changes. I feel like the rapid change in March has calmed down to an extent. And so that extraordinarily high cortisol level is slowing down a little bit. And we can't stand to stay in that rapid cycle of change like we were in March because it's going to wear all of us out. Um, so we need to be talking with patients. It's more stressful than usual. What kinds of strategies do you have? What kinds of tools do you have in your pocket? Let's talk about 
and think about them and what are you going to do to try to prevent returning to using? Uh, what kinds of things have worked well for you? And, and just even if my patient can't access a group therapy appointment, I can kind of remind her or him of some of the techniques they've learned. Most of my patients have been in and out of different programs and, and bring with them a lot of different resources, some successful, not, some not as successful. Um, and then uh, another reminder is to think about just all of our social determinants of health. So prisons and jails, more and more people are getting released early, so making sure that we have ways for them to access services and understanding that we're not closed and we do have availability. We bring people through in our, uh, into our walk-in clinic. We are actually building physical structures in our buildings so we can separate our respiratory walk-in clinic from the rest of our non-respiratory care uh, because this is not going away in a month despite what we might hope, that this is something that will be with us for the next couple of years and that the new way of doing things is going to be with us for a while. Um, we think about homelessness. A lot of my patients are homeless and, and all the access and challenges and all the things. I, I think um, I appreciate that uh, people who are experiencing homelessness are being talked about a lot more in the dialogue among our state when Dr. Shaw speaks of them and very respectfully as persons experiencing homelessness. I think that's really helpful, that patient first language, which I, I did not use about 30 seconds ago, but I'll try to catch myself. Think about domestic violence and the increased risk of being home together a lot, all the time, transportation challenges, food insecurity. These weren't here before, but they're all more pronounced. Food, uh, food pantries running out of food. And then a lot of parenting issues. We wanted to you know, really think about <clears throat> people who have active DHHS cases, um, kids who are in environments that are really stressful and they might be experiencing mistreatment, so they have higher degree of risk and less people watching in on them. The school secretary is not noticing that they're coming to school without appropriate gear in the middle of winter and things like that. So there's just less eyes on these kids. Um, a lot of our patients are struggling with the fact that they are not allowed any physical visitation with their kids anymore. And that is a huge struggle. It just really tears up my heart. Uh, one of my patients talked about at least being able to FaceTime with her kids, uh, but she has had no face-to-face -face visitation with them for uh, about six weeks now. And, and uh, the final thing before we go into questions, I like to just, uh, well, two final things. Uh, think about um, taking care of ourselves. So in our handout, we have a lot of lists about things that we can do in terms of mnemonics and techniques for taking care of ourselves. So you've all heard at this point of the main frontline warm line. Um, there are uh, project echoes, there are drop-ins for different associations. I was able to find a lot for physicians. I did not find any specifically for physicians assistants and nurse practitioners. I looked at their association websites. Uh, there may be some, but I did not readily find them. Um, by some quick searches, uh, but within groups that we work with in different associations, there are those opportunities there for virtual peer support for ourselves, and I, um, I put a lot of resources on there. I wanted to point out, this is available to everyone, the American Academy of Family Physicians had a webinar on April 17th, and I'll put the link in with the resources, and it was about the emotional health of patients and providers. These webinars are Friday nights at 8 p.m., which I thought, who would have ever thought, you know what, I haven't missed one. I've been to four in a row. Every Friday night at 8 p.m., I'm going to these webinars. They are extraordinary, but the one on emotional health was just uh, very focused on things that we need to be cognizant of both in our patients and ourselves and extraordinarily well done. Uh, let's see what else. So the final thing we just wanted to touch on was telehealth. Uh, I feel like we've been in this for six weeks now. There was a rapid... Uh, uh, running to get into telehealth um, and most people have sort of ironed it out and figured out the kinks now in terms of the rules being relaxed uh, what is okay uh, here's a joke from my mom my mom had a friend who was hospitalized and so she called and asked for information and they said they couldn't give her information and she texted me and said I thought HIPAA was like gone now 
And I said, no, no, mom. HIPAA in certain circumstances is different than it was before. For instance, the platform you use for telehealth does not have to be HIPAA compliant, but you should do what you can to make it secure. So people hear all kinds of things, but no, mom, HIPAA still exists. But in some ways of how we practice, we've changed it a little bit. Um, same thing with 42 CFR in terms of the clarifications for that. Uh, there are a lot of telemedicine resources. And uh, one of the ones I'd like to point out, which we'll put in um, these uh, resource lists with all hot links, are the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center, which has a, um, a reimbursement page particular for Maine. So all of the payers in Maine, what they will reimburse and how they'll reimburse across different platforms. And I think that that's an extraordinarily helpful document if you need more information in that area. Qualadime has an extensive page in terms of resources. And then the state of Maine, we gave you links to Maine Care Services, the Governor's Office, DHHS, the Office of Behavioral Health, the newly renamed Office of Behavioral Health, uh, the Maine CDC, which is on my favorites, probably on your favorites too. So the last thing I'll say before questions is naloxone. Naloxone, naloxone, there are still supplies available uh, through the director of opioid coordination, Gordon Smith, at the State House. They have still mechanisms to try to request that to make sure that it's being distributed, uh, to make sure it's getting to the different um, risk reduction workplaces. And so uh, prescribe it if they have insurance and give it when you can and uh, make sure that we're talking to people about that. So we're going to open up to questions. We only have five in the Q&A. You get to vote them oh, up and down. Yeah, don't worry. There'll be some coming. <laughs> I think it really is starting around. And we do have some folks from Maine Care on as well that um, can, our panelists as well, so they can chime in as needed. Uh, but a lot of it obviously starts with the urine drug screen and, you know, is it okay to substitute swabs for the urine analysis? Um, and different pieces like that. And I know um, Ben added some comments that I think came from Callie from the portion of section 80 below saying, during SUD treatment with buprenorphine, a urine drug test or medically appropriate toxicology test for all relevant illicit drugs must be administered as clinically indicated initially and randomly thereafter. Prescribers must determine the frequency of toxicology testing by evaluating the appropriateness in relation to the member's stage of treatment. All maintenance members must receive a minimum of eight toxicology tests per year. So again, um, Elaine and Elizabeth, I can kick this to you, but just a lot of questions kind of between, you know, the, the swabs, is it okay to substitute swabs for the urine screens? I know Elaine, you all have been doing the swabs. Um, so kind of a little bit of feedback on your process with that perhaps. Sure, so I, I certainly can let the main care folks speak to their, their rules far better than I can. Um, though we've been doing swabs and I'm sure compliance, I mean, we have to go through a whole process before we can launch any of these things. So I'm sure that it was approved, but certainly let them answer that. We moved to swabs um, predominantly, well, for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, urine um, has challenges. It's, you know, harder to handle. It sometimes leaks in transport. Um, sometimes you have situations where people will drink a lot of water before they come in, so they're dilute specimens, kind of what do you do with that? Um, the other part was really around, you know, observed specimens and, you know, how do you, how do you make that process comfortable, which I really landed on the fact that you couldn't or that we couldn't figure out a way to do that. Um, and we had a lot of patients, particularly those who had experienced sexual trauma, which was a lot of our patients, um, who really expressed, um, you know, uncomfortableness with that. And, you know, last thing we want to do to our patients is shame them in the course of their treatment. Um, and the saliva has just been super easy for us. And um, it's, it's great data. Um, you know, it's, it can be put in the mouth. Like if I'm doing an individual visit, they stick it in the mouth, um, you know, while the MA is doing the blood pressure and all the rest of the stuff that the MA is doing. And patients can actually talk while they have it in their mouth. Um, and in our group visit settings, it's actually even easier because patients will be kind of completing the paperwork that they do when they come in, um, just in terms of how they're doing, and, and they just have the, the saliva stick in their mouth, and they take it out themselves, and oftentimes put it in the container themselves, and they like it, actually, because they can, um, you know, they see that their name is on it, and, and all those pieces, so we do urines, it comes back, you know, the saliva is for us about five days, at least at this point, and, you know, so we do urines, like in the emergency department induction, something that we need really rapid data, or if I'm following a patient on the inpatient unit, 
um, I still do urines because the, just in terms of the time lapse. Um, so I might need more urgent information, but um, from a quality of, of specimen and results, it's been really, really, I've, I have no concerns. I've really liked it. I'll follow up real quickly to one thing I saw pop up in a chat box, which is the one versus eight. So the state of Maine chapter 488 law for prescribing any opioid of which buprenorphine is one, but any opioid, the minimum, it says urine drug screen, but we would think that the minimum toxicology is once a year for any opioid prescription for any patient. That's chapter 488. What we're talking about is the Office of Maine Care Services rules which say that a person in buprenorphine treatment should be receiving at least eight screens per year. And I, I think that may have been a rule that I myself was not fully aware of, but I have to tell you that especially as I'm seeing people early in recovery, they're gonna get eight in the first two months with me because they're coming in weekly. Sometimes if I'm really concerned about a patient, I'll, I'll have them called back during the middle of the week. and so. Uh, it's something for people specifically with main care in buprenorphine treatment. Um, and, and it kind of makes sense. We talked about even people who are once a month script, who are getting checked once a month. It, it's going to be pretty hard to fall below that eight per year, even though we've missed one or two in the past couple of months. Okay. Um, and kind of a follow up along some of those lines is um, there are some providers or rumor of some providers are sending um, the swab or analysis home to the client and accepting photos. Um, I don't know if either of you have any experience with that, but they were just asking if this would be better adapted to swab than the urine analysis piece of it. It would certainly make sense. Uh, you know, we were offered a, a sort of tamper resistant option um, for from the company that we use, um, but we weren't able, we don't currently do this video stuff with our patients. So um, it really, we couldn't do it over the phone. I mean, there would be no point, but um, I think it's a great option. And it's certainly, I know people are doing it. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I, I sort of feel like I don't, again, I don't speak for main care, but if you're doing the best you can to sort of provide structure and accountability and monitoring, you know, I, I think we're all doing the best we can in a really difficult time. And hi, this is Olivia from Main Care. I can, I, I can um, chime in a little bit. So I think uh, it sounds like we might need to put out some clarification on the urine drug screening requirements across different sections because it can get very confusing. But um, it's actually for for the eight uh, is correct. It's for anyone prescribing uh, buprenorphine. Uh, for substance use disorder treatment. And the only thing that's called out is that maintenance phase. But again, so maintenance is eight minimum per year. And then you would presumably go up from there um, with people who are in induction or in the stabilization phase. Um, but actually for methadone providers as well, their policy requires um, drug use disorder testing, as they call it, um, no less frequently than every 30 days. And so um, you really have, it depends on, you know, which, service you're providing and we can certainly help people navigate that but um, I think what what we at mean care why we decided not to change any type of toxicology testing at this point was because that's also consistent with what the federal government has done they haven't changed requirements it's more about thinking about different ways to meet the requirements which is what you know is really great about the conversation today and just it is true that sometimes we say you're in drug screening in our policy but I think um, swabs it's, it's meant to include um, other types of appropriate toxicology testing like swabs. So we'll make sure that that's clarified in future rulemakings. But um, we'll, I'll add this to the list of things that we should put some guidance out on to just make sure everyone's clear. Perfect, thank you for doing that. Um, so let's see, another question. Do providers have mechanisms in place to outreach to patients that have fallen out of contact with the clinic? Um, so this person or this clinic's had some patients um, that were really engaged during the initial stages of the pandemic, but have since kind of fell out of care in the sub subsequent weeks. Um, so, you know, Elaine, Elizabeth, kind of what tactics have you used around that? And do are you know, what motivators do you have to really engage um, with those harder to reach patients? Do you want me to, do you want to, I mean, we have had some people and it really worries me, um, you know, people that 
um, you know, have been doing well and have sort of gone missing. Um, and that's another reason we try to um, get a couple different phone numbers just for that reason. We were very vague when we call, but we've reached out to emergency contacts just to say, you know, the doctor's office is trying to reach you, something very vague. Um, but it's not, um, it, the benefit, of course, I work in a primary care practice, so it's not, you know, it, it doesn't um, indicate that they're in recovery in any way by just leaving a message. Um, so, but it's hard and, and I worry about those folks and, and, and people falling off the radar. And if you don't have a way to get them, um, it's scary. Um, and I hope they reappear at some point. But um, in terms of keeping folks engaged, uh, you know, I think we've been trying to sort of really sort of use our recovery supports and online counseling and really having a lot of counseling with our, or a lot of contact with our counselors. Um, and then the peer recovery community as well. Um, there's a lot going on there through like MAR and other agencies. So trying to get folks into engaged with that as much as they can. I don't know, Elizabeth, do you have any other thoughts? I would just add from our standpoint, specifically because I work in a bridge clinic, which is a low barrier medication first model, I'm trying to really embrace that even more so right now. If people miss an appointment, if I, I'm, I'm trying to be more understanding and I know and the data tells us that my patient is much less likely to die when they're taking my prescription. So if they're not jumping through all the hoops and following all the rules, I'm still going to work really hard to engage them and get them back in. And if they, if they fall off, they fall off the radar for a week or two and then they want to come back. You know, not not creating barriers that they have to do this, 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 and this, or they missed their appointment last week. Can I give them a script and then, you know, for three days until they can schedule a telehealth appointment with one of my partners because I am there only there a half a day a week. So I'm trying to be really, really mindful of that idea that my job is to keep them from dying and 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 just kind of keep that at the forefront and if i can get it and then i think if i can get them engaged long enough i can actually get them into recovery because my people are fresh and they're still using other substances and they're not 100 percent committed so i'm in that really middle ground where i'm trying to get them where they need to be to do the hard recovery work i'm just trying to keep them alive until they get there so those are the kinds of things i say to myself when i'm like oh should i just quote unquote call in this refill and I try to do it, but, but have some parameters on it, but I'm not going to say no. Well, try not to. Okay. Um, and another question, um, Elaine, you had mentioned using an office voicemail and having patients call into that line a few times a week to see if they needed to present for a specimen collection or a med check. Um, has that been an effective process with patients? Do you feel like that's worked out well? So we instituted this as a random uh, drug screen program probably, I don't know, five years ago now. Um, and, you know, our practice, our program is a couple hundred patients, and um, we were really finding two things. One, you know, we there was sort of provider bias around who was getting called in for randoms, and two, it was really hard to reach people. We did a lot of chasing, and it was not very rewarding for our staff. Um, so we sort of flipped it on its head um, five years ago and created this random um, program where patients call twice a week. Um, they listen to a recorded voicemail message. Every patient is actually, we use states as a, as a means to um, um, assign people to a group. So like I could be Massachusetts, Kayla would be New Hampshire, Elizabeth would be, you know, Nevada or something. So there's five patients assigned to each state. And we tell people like, you know, if you call and you hear your state, and so Massachusetts is called, then you need to do something, um, come in within 24 hours. And if you um, hear any other state, you just hang up the phone. Um, and they hear their state generally three to four times a year. Um, it's really worked well for us. Um, and we it's a very generic message. So there's actually other practices in our healthcare system that use it. So it just says Maine General's Outpatient Testing Program or something benign. Um, so if anyone wants to listen to it, the phone number is uh, 207-861-5099. You do have to call within after hours or something. It says you've reached it outside the call-in times. But generally, it's up basically Monday through Thursday night at 5. Um, and it's really worked well for us. Um, and um, we do, um, you know, people do graduate off that if they are able to um, maintain um, stability for a couple years, and then they fall into sort of our regular controlled substances group where we can call them in if we have a concern. Um, and we try to do that as well. But um, it's, it's worked well, mostly. Um, the structure, accountability, keeps people on a schedule. And I, I, I just really use it as reinforcement for my patients that 
case in my open TPS cases, like, hey, look, this is great. You're doing really well in treatment. Let's, you know, every time you show for a random and everything looks great, that's awesome for, for what we're trying to show DHS in terms of how well you're doing. So I, I really try to use it as a positive, motivating um, thing as opposed to sort of a punitive thing. I really try to, um, but again, that part of my practice is, is sort of long-term stable primary care patients. Um, so, it, it, you know, we don't use it as much in sort of the high acuity place because we're seeing them that frequently anyway. Great. Um, and Elizabeth, somebody asked if there's information you can share about those Friday night webinars. So they're available if you're an AAFP member. So if you're a family physician, uh, I think they're available live, but they also broadcast them on Facebook and they're recorded on YouTube. So I think they're open to everyone to attend. So it's Friday night, 7 central, which is 8 Eastern and um, I, on the AAFP Facebook page and on YouTube and the old ones are, are on there as well. I, I think maybe only the CME credit is available to members, um, but the, the um, substance is available to everyone. This week it's an emergency physician who is family medicine trained. Last week it was about uh, ventilate, ventilator management for those of us who haven't done it so much. Um, so they have a pretty broad variety of topics. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, and so a few different questions, and I'm not sure if you guys will have the answer to this, but I'll ask in case. Um, so do either of you know if the, the prison systems are offering Vivitrol? Um, someone had a patient who recently relapsed diverting Suboxone and was just arrested. And so they were just asking if you know. I'm not, maybe Elaine knows more because she works with the statewide opioid clinical advisory committee. I think, um, you know, there's a difference between prisons and jails. The prisons are state run and they have one set of rules and then every single jail has their own set of rules. And so which ones even do buprenorphine, who they give it to, how soon before release they get it, all of those are different. So I don't know if Elaine knows more. Yeah, that, that captures it very well. And in, in, in terms, I think the bigger, you know, other big concern is, you know, who gets continued if they have an outside prescription, which isn't necessarily everyone. Um, and, you know, I, I think Vivitrol is available some places, not in others. So I, I, I try to, as much as I can, have a contact within the jail um, so that when something happens or something comes up, um, they can call me or I can help facilitate or something because um, it does change all the time. And, and, and her point is very valid around the um, prison versus jails. But I know it's something we're trying to work on as a state to get a little bit of consistency and sort of understand what everybody's doing um, and then who's following the patients that start in jail and how that all works. And, it's complicated even when you think you understand it all. So it is a work in progress. Okay, so definitely for that person, it might be best to try to follow up um, with the jail in that area and see if you can find more information on that from them. Okay, um, and then there was, there was some discussion in chat as well as the Q&A around phone access and that some mobile carriers have opened their kind of wide range community Wi-Fi networks to non-customers. I don't know if any of us are experts in this or if anyone's confirmed this or heard from their um, patients that this has been expanded, but I know personally my carrier has sent me notices that they've expanded their service. So I think a lot of us have kind of received those. I don't know necessarily um, if the, you know, this population is necessarily taking use of that. It also can depend on sometimes just where you live, no matter how much expanded service there is, if you just don't have reliable access it's really hard to do telehealth appointments it's more the latter for me uh, just the remoteness of my, many of my patients um but but yes i think people are getting more but it's still a challenge and then um and then running out of minutes you know is perpetually a challenge that's the number one thing they're asking for in the bangor area homeless shelters is minutes cards for phones uh that's their biggest need right now okay and I just wanted to call attention to in chat, people have put the links um, for the main care benefits manual that's in there in case folks have questions about those rules. The link um, as well to fill out kind of the naloxone order form for the state if you need some additional supplies of that. Um, so we just want to make sure that people see those links in the chat as well that you have those resources you can access as well. Um, and this webinar is being recorded today and will be sent out as well. So you'll have this as a reference point too. And we'll add those links to my list because I'm missing the main care benefit manual link and the naloxone order form link. So 
Right. And yeah, and Elaine and Elizabeth do kind of have show notes that we'll send out after with the recording too that have all these different links in them. Um, so hopefully our goal is to have everything in one document for you all so you're not hunting around looking for where the different information is. There's almost too much information. There are some fabulous resources, including the Qualadyne page, uh, but there's so much there. Uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out, well, which resource do I want and what category does it fall in? And that's true of all of these different websites right now. Definitely. Um, and then I do see in chat to somebody asked, um, what is the low barrier model or what is a low barrier model? So the first I heard about medication first, so I call it high risk, low barrier, medication first. First I heard about it as a project in Missouri and we connected with them through our state opioid response network previously called the STAR TA. Uh, and uh, it, it's just a model where it's kind of like the housing first model. If you have someone who is experiencing homelessness, who has a pervasive mental illness, and a bunch of other health challenges, the number one thing you can do is house them. It, it, it helps every aspect of their health care outcomes and determinants. You've heard about hospitals and other places actually putting people, homeless people into housing, and that's the number one thing. So you think about that in the context of medication-assisted treatment is getting them on the medication first. So it's not the classical teaching we heard that everyone needs to be in counseling and they need to have an intake. It means they walk in the door, they ask for the medicine, and if they meet our criteria and they're appropriate, they get the medication first. They get continued on the medication that first month or two to stabilize them because it's really hard to make it to a counseling appointment when you're still looking for drugs on the street. And so if we can get our patients inducted, so to speak, and through that first month and stabilize from a pharmacological standpoint and have them on the appropriate dose, they're going to be that much more successful in getting into that recovery phase where they're doing the work, they're showing up for groups. And so that's the thinking behind it, although it challenges some of the classical teachings that we all learned in our x waiver training and moving forward. And so I don't know all the outcomes that they've seen in Missouri, um, but it, it's, a, it's a different way to approach the medication. Yeah, so really taking that harm reduction um, approach as well. Great. Um, okay, so I think we have time for one more question. So just a follow up to that is for this model, where does the physical exam and labs fit in? It's interesting because so all that has changed, right? So prior to March 1st or March whatever it is, uh, you were required to do an in-person uh, visit with a patient, including a physical exam, and it's called the Ryan Height Act, spelled in an odd way, um, and that has been waived. So you could do an initial exam over telehealth. I'll tell you, I haven't done any initial exams over telehealth because my patients are high risk, because they're using multiple substances. Uh, they come into walking care, their script, and then they come back to see me face to face because there's just so many moving parts with, with these patients. Um, and, and my partners and I have had some debate about the physical exam from a billing standpoint. If you're billing a new patient visit, you have to do so much of a physical exam. Our patients, because they were in our own walk-in care, we're billing them as an established patient. So I do a pretty cursory exam, kind of a quick head to toe, like what's necessary because it's not required by billing. Although there are a lot of guidelines about what should be done, I tailor it to the, the patients themselves and what's going on. And my, obviously my physical exams are very limited now. Uh, you know, and if I'm seeing patients face to face in the room, I'm still trying to create some separation. I had a patient who took his mask off the other day and I wanted to tell him, put your mask back on. Um, and I'm trying not to touch my patients if I can, uh, if I need to, if I need to listen to their lungs, I will. But if there's no medical need reason that I need to be doing all these different touch points, then, then I don't. So, so some of that has evolved with telehealth and, and the crisis. And I also document in every single chart that there's a public health emergency and that I'm doing things a little bit differently than the standard approach to care. And I put that in every single chart. 
Great, thank you. Well, we are out of time for today, um, but I appreciate both you, Elaine and Elizabeth for doing this with us. I know we've had a lot of questions come up as the weeks have gone on um, with this pandemic and adjusting. So we do appreciate you both um, chiming in and kind of sharing your experiences. And also thank you to Main Care for helping us put this together. Um, again, if people have any questions, you can contact myself, my information's on the screen or Morgan who helps us out with all of these. And a final reminder that the link for the evaluation is in the chat box. So you can either copy and paste that and put it into your browser or certainly reach out to myself if you didn't get the link and you need it. But once again, thank you, Elizabeth and Elaine. It's been great hearing um, all this information you had to share. We'll send it out. Um, we'll download the recording, get that going and send it out to everyone. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon.